This is part two of lecture 13a, where we're going to do some examples now about hypothesis testing. So if I were you and I had just watched that first video, the concept of the type one error and how we choose the rejection region still would not be totally clear to me. So don't worry if that's you, because hopefully when we put it in the context of an actual problem, we'll be able to determine how we choose the rejection region specifically. So uh, this is the problem we have. These are the same slides that we had before. And don't forget the, the paper notes have been uploaded as a PDF to Carmen as well. So I encourage you to have those in front of you as we go through this video. Example one, we'll talk about the count of platelets in a blood sample. So let's suppose we know that the average count of platelets in a nanoliter of blood should be normally distributed with a mean of 250 cells per nanoliter. So you may be wondering right away, well, how do we know the mean is 250? I thought we never knew the parameter. And so what probably happened here is we had a sample of people who were known to be healthy, who were known to have healthy blood, and we took a very large sample of those folks and found 250 was the average. Or maybe we have you know, a hematologist or somebody who knows all about blood who has determined that this is the value that is what a healthy person should have. So there's ways to have an idea of what you believe the parameter is beforehand, even though in reality, we don't technically know the true parameter behind the number of platelets that should be in somebody's blood sample. So I've given you this information. Is the fact that the average count is gonna be normally distributed going to be important here? Yeah, in just a minute when we start talking about the sampling distribution of our test statistics. So that'll be important again in a moment. So we observe seven patients with the following counts. And so there's the data written there. Based on this data, based on this evidence, is there evidence that the patient population has elevated platelet counts? Is there, you know, maybe these seven patients just came from one particular hospital. Is there evidence that that our population that we have have elevated platelet counts, um, which would be indicative of, I had to look it up, this is thrombocytosis, is the disease that you have if your platelets are elevated. So if we start to see lots of people who overall tend to tell us that the mean is higher than 250, it may tell us maybe then that there's something going on in the neighborhood or there's something going on in the state where this hospital is located. So step one in hypothesis testing, go back, you know, have the notes in front of you from previously. Remember we had four steps. First thing we wanna do is write hypotheses. And so the hypotheses that we'll formulate here, think about what you're trying to show. So remember on the previous slide, I asked, is there evidence that our patient population has elevated platelet counts? If that's what I'm trying to find evidence for, then that's going to be my alternative hypothesis. If that's what I'm trying to show, then the burden of proof is on us, the researcher and the statistician to show that. So that starts out as our alternative hypothesis. So that's why my HA, my alternative is that the true mean is something greater than 250 cells per nanoliter. And my alternative hypothesis is that we just have the status quo, that everybody's just healthy as we have assumed they have been up to this point. So there's my null and alternative hypotheses there. Step two is to choose the rejection rule. And as I mentioned in the previous video, the way we choose the rejection rule is to control the type one error rate. So what I've written there, oh, well maybe we could just choose 300 as our cutoff. If I observe an average of more than 300, that would be evidence against the hypothesis. That's not a good scientific way to choose a rejection rule because it's very subjective, number one. How'd you come up with 300? And number two, that rule is gonna be different depending on how many people we observe. Maybe if that's the average out of 5,000 patients versus if that's the average out of seven patients, those are two different uh, evidences in terms of the strength that we have. So what we're gonna do when we choose a rejection rule is control the type one error rate at 1%. So I'm gonna make this so that there's a 1% chance I've, a I've made a type one error, assuming that all hypothesis is true. So how do we go about doing that? Um, books here, put that on top. All right, so uh, we've written our hypotheses, and so now we need to choose our rejection criterion with the alpha is 1%. How do we do that? So always have your hypotheses written here. So that you know 
so that you know um, what kind of evidence you're looking for. So in this case, note the alternative is that the mean is greater than 250. So if I observe an average of much higher than 250, that's gonna be evidence against my null hypothesis. So we need to think about whether we're looking for a high number or a low number with what we get from our data. In this case, we're looking for a high number as evidence against the null in, in favor of the alternative. So um, choose a rejection region. So we're fixing the type one error rate alpha equals 0 0.01. So alpha is 1% there. How does this translate into the context of our problem that we have at hand? So what I recommend doing is drawing a picture. Drawing a picture of what? Well, remember, back when we were talking about confidence intervals, the idea of the sampling distribution was one of the most important parts of each problem that we had. So the sampling distribution is going to be the key to solving this problem again. What is the sampling distribution that we have? Well, remember, if I'm making hypotheses about mu, which is the mean, I should use an unbiased estimator to, to do that, right? So, so I'll be using X bar as my unbiased estimator. I'll be using X bar to help me determine whether I have evidence for or against the null hypothesis. So do I know a sampling distribution about X bar in this problem then? Well, remember what I mentioned a moment ago that my data were normally distributed. So we know that if we're talking about X bar and we have normally distributed data, we do have a sampling distribution we can write associated with that, right? We've used it before to build confidence intervals and it's gonna be the same thing that we use here. So we can get a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom from this statistic. If we take x bar minus mu over s over square root of n, just like it did for our confidence intervals, this is going to follow a t n minus 1 distribution. I'm going to be very specific here and write the little null hypothesis symbol over my follows symbol, over the tilde there, to emphasize that this assumption is only true when the null hypothesis is true. So I'm going to operate this whole uh, calculation under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true until I have assumption otherwise. Because if we think about well, what are we going to plug into all these numbers, we can compute x bar from the seven observations we have, and we'll do that in a moment. We can compute s. We know n equals 7. But what do we plug in for mu? Anytime you're doing a hypothesis test, you go under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. So 250 is what I'm going to plug in for mu here because that's what I'm assuming to be true. So if this follows a tn minus 1, remember my goal here was to calibrate my type 1 error rate so that I have an alpha of 1%. So what that means is I need to look at this sampling distribution and see where 1%, where the threshold is, will tell me where the rejection region is. So what I've done is I've written the sampling distribution of this. Why am I using X bar? Because it's an unbiased estimator for mu that I'm trying to conduct the hypothesis test on. And I'm writing it this way because I know the exact sampling distribution of this statistic here. So I said to draw a sketch. So I'm going to sketch a T, uh, a T6 would be my distribution, right? Because n equals 7. So here's my T6 distribution. And so where does the 1%, where does the alpha equal 1% happen? So keep in mind that, I, as I mentioned before, mu greater than 250 is my alternative hypothesis. So if I observe something on the higher end of this, that's going to be evidence against my null in favor of my alternative. So, So over on the right side of my distribution is where the rejection region is going to occur. If I observe something over here, that's going to be evidence that would lead me to fail to reject. Because the evidence over on this side is going to support the null hypothesis. The evidence on this side is going to support the alternative. So keep in mind, based on how the problem is, I might be drawing this picture backwards in a different problem. You got to look to your alternative hypothesis to see which side is the rejection region and which side is the fail to reject region. Because my alternative said I'm looking for evidence greater than 250 as my mean, I need to look at the greater than side of my sampling distribution T6 here to figure out where the rejection region occurs. So where does it occur specifically? I'm going to like kind of draw a little bit of a line right there because I've tried to draw it in a place so that I have 1% on this side. So here is, 
So here's the 1% type 1 error rate now finally coming into play. So if I can draw it on my sampling distribution so that I have 1% over here, that means there's 99% over this way, right? So this line here tells me exactly where my rejection region begins. If I observe, here's what I'm going to compute. I'm going to compute the x bar minus mu divided by s over square root of n. I'm going to compute that value. If it lies over here on this side of my region, I'm going to fail to reject. If it lies over here, on the other side of my region, then I'm going to reject final hypothesis. So the question is, where is this cutoff specifically? I just kind of eyeball it in my picture. I got to be more specific than that. And so keep in mind, if I have 1% over here, there's 99% over here. So this is just the 99th percentile of a T6. How do I compute the 99th percentile of a T6? So let's switch back to our slides here and see the computations that we've got then. So take a moment, pause the video if you need to, and get the picture sketch so you have this in front of you, because it will be helpful as we go through and actually compute the numbers associated here. OK, so let's come back into this. What does alpha equal 0.01 translate to in our problem? Well, first thing we did was we wrote the sampling distribution to remind ourselves that x bar minus mu divided by s over square root of n is a tn minus 1. So the rejection region for the, what I just explained, the reasons I just explained and see your picture, is going to be the 99th percentile of that tn minus 1. You can look it up on a chart. I think it's much better to do that in R. Remember, we can use the QT function. I need the 99th percentile of the T with 7 minus 1 degrees of freedom. And so 3.14 is the quantile. So if you go back to the picture that I drew a moment ago, where that vertical bar occurs is at 3.14. So my rejection region begins at positive 3.14. I'm going to plug in x bar minus mu over s over square root of n. So here I call it t sub obs. I call it t sub observed. That's the t statistic that I actually observed. Remember, I'm assuming that that thing follows a t distribution, so I might as well use a t to represent it. So I'm going to use t observed. I plug in all the values we have. Um, if you, based on these observations I gave you on the previous slide here, what's the x bar and what's the variance so I can compute the mean of these observations. The mean of all of these is, I got too many. Uh, the mean is 305, which is not what I have written in the notes, is it? 319.3, where did I get that from? Um, I think I have a mistake in the notes I made. Give me a second. Okay, I found the mistake that I made. I had written 275 in the slides originally. It should be 375 is the number that we have there. So 300, 350, 375, not 275. It's correct in your paper notes, the PDF. And now I've fixed the slide here. So let's try that again. What is the average of these seven observations? Because I, I need the x bar and I need the s, right? So the average of these is 319.2 cells per nanoliter. Keep track of the units associated, because now we're starting to answer scientific questions, and we need to keep in mind the science underlying these problems. So my average of those seven observations is 319.3 cells per nanoliter. Notice when I did this in R, I had to use the lowercase c there that concatenates, so I need to concatenate all those values together to compute the mean of that vector. And then I can also, that's the mean, 319, and then the standard deviation, SD, is 74.9 cells per nanoliter. And so now that matches the numbers I've got here. So let's come back to our slides here. So if I plug in all those values, the two, the 319.3 is my x bar, the 250 was my assumed mean, and that's very important here. What do you plug in for mu? You look to the null hypothesis, because just like in a courtroom, we were innocent until proven guilty. When we conduct the hypothesis test, the mean is 250, like I did for my null hypothesis, until I've shown otherwise. So you plug in 250 for mu, because that's what you're assuming it is. Divided by the standard error, 74.9. This 74.9, remember, just came from the standard deviation of my seven observations that I did here. 
divided by the square root of n, which is seven. And so what do we get for that? If you plug those values in, you get 2.45. So what that means is if I come back to my picture here, if I come back to my picture then, remember the rejection region began at 3.14. That's the 99th percentile of the T6. I actually observed 2.45 which is here. And it is, as you can see, my rejection region occurs to the right because I'm looking for evidence of mu greater than 250. So my observed T value, my 2.45, my X bar minus 250 over S over square root of N falls inside the fail to reject region. So what that means is those values that we observed are not incompatible with my assumption that the mean really is 250. I do not have enough evidence that the mean has increased from 250. So I fail to reject my null hypothesis. So because my observed T statistic, and sometimes it'll be, remember, keep in mind for this particular problem, the rejection region was dictated by what the alternative hypothesis was. So I was less than the threshold here, and so I reject, but sometimes it'll be different for different problems. Sometimes if I'm on the other side of my rejection region, I'll reject. It all depends on what the alternative hypothesis is. So as I skate, say here, sketch a picture to help you with these problems, to help you make the decision about whether you reject or fail to reject. So let's do another problem then with blood types. And so the situation we have here is that your blood type can be either positive or negative. Let's say we observe 40 patients, 12 had a positive blood type and 28 had a negative blood type. Let's test the null hypothesis that the probability that you are positive blood type is 50% versus the alternative that it's less than 50% at a level of alpha equals 0.05. So I've kind of given you the first step here by writing the hypotheses. And uh, I've given you an alpha level. So let's, let's start our new problem here. So again, like I did before, I need to think about, remember, just like how we did with our confidence intervals, I need to think about an unbiased estimator for the parameter I'm trying to test. Keep in mind, no p hats in the, in the um, hypotheses. Hypotheses are about unknown values. The parameters are unknown. So make sure, I never want to see a p hat or an x bar or something in a hypothesis. Make sure the parameters are what you have there. So if I'm hypothesizing about p, the proportion of people who have a positive blood type, I need an unbiased estimator for P, so how about I use P hat as my unbiased estimator. Just like we did when we were making confidence intervals, I need to know the sampling distribution of this P hat, and then the problem will fall apart for me. What is the sampling distribution of P hat? Remember, P hat, when we have a Bernoulli, is just X bar in disguise. You're still adding up one if you have a positive blood type, zero if you have a negative blood type. So you're still adding up the observations and dividing by N. P hat is just X bar in disguise. And X bar, as we know, behaves according to the central limit theorem with a large enough sample. Did you notice for this problem, I didn't tell you anything was normally distributed because we're talking about positive and negative, yes and no. But I did tell you we have 40 people that we're, patient, that we're uh, testing now, we have 40 patients. So I think we've got a high enough sample size to use the central limit theorem to describe the sampling distribution of P hat in this case. So let's, uh, we could say, We could say we've used this before. The, the true, the x, the p hat has a sampling distribution normal with the mean of the true p and the standard error, the variance of the individuals divided by n. We've seen this many times with the central limit theorem, but I'm going to standardize it like I did in the last problem. I want to write this as a standard normal. So instead of p hat, I'm going to say. And I'm going to do like I did before and emphasize with the little null symbol over the tilde that this only follows this distribution under my assumption of the null hypothesis. 
So I'm making a little bit of an assumption about this to think that this follows this, this distribution. So I can get a standard normal out of this statistic. Why don't I call this, we called it T before, why don't we call it Z now? Because now it's a standard normal and we use Z generally when we talk about the normal zero one. So as I just said previously, it'd be crazy to do a problem like this without a picture. Now that we've written the sampling distribution, we can sketch a picture of the scenario that we have here. So there's my normal zero one, here's my sampling distribution. Look to the alternative to determine where the rejection region is going to begin. I'm looking for evidence that the proportion is less than 50%. So if I observe a very small value, since I have the less than here, a small value is what's gonna be evidence against my null in favor of the alternative. So the rejection region, now this is opposite from the problem we just did. The rejection region is over here on the left. The fail to reject, FTR is what I've written there. It's kind of hard to read. The fail to reject region is if I observe high values. So if I'm gonna to fail to reject on this side, on the, see now I'm looking in the mirror, looking at my laptop, this is hard. So my fail to reject region is up here. My rejection region is over here. Where does it begin specifically? Well, I choose where the rejection region begins by looking at the alpha level. I wanna control my type one error rate at 5%. So 5% of the time, I'm willing to make a type one error, assuming my null hypothesis is true. Where does 5% begin in my sampling distribution? I'm just gonna kinda of eyeball it there and assume then that this portion here is 5%. So what I've really written here is the fifth percentile of a standard normal. Where does the fifth percentile of a standard normal occur? If the mean is at zero there, like we have for my standard normal, where does this bar occur that the threshold changes from fail to reject to reject? So like it was in the previous problem, winning three out of 11 coin tosses, winning two out of 11, winning one out of 11. At some point in there, we switch from having enough to not enough evidence. That's where this bar is happening. Where do we switch from having enough evidence to reject versus not enough evidence to reject? At the fifth percentile of the standard normal, where does that occur? Well, we'll go back to R to determine that. So you can look that up in a chart or you can use the quantile function in R, which I think is a, a better way to do it. So Q norm 0 0.05, the fifth percentile of standard normal 0, 01, says that occurs at negative 1.64. So let's go back to my picture then. That threshold where you switch from rejecting to not rejecting occurs at negative 1.64. So I'm going to plug in my values then for my test statistic is what we call this, the, and I can plug everything in here, right? I know p hat was 12 out of 40. I'm assuming p is 50%, and the p's show up down here. Remember, when we made a confidence interval, we didn't know p, and we had to plug in p hat. But now I can assume that p is 50% based on my hypothesis test. So I can plug in values for all these numbers now and compute a z, and compute a z observed. So let's switch to the slides and do that now. And then remember my cutoff for rejection is at negative 1.64. Am I gonna reject or fail to reject this hypothesis? So this slide just summarizes everything that I said. Let's plug in our values. Um, 12 out of 40 people had a positive blood type and then see how all the places that 0.5 shows up. That's because that's under the null hypothesis, the assumed value of P divided by 40 observations, and we get um, negative 2.53 is the value you get if you plug all those in. So compare that to where my rejection region began. It began at negative 1.64, and I observed something to the left of that. I observed something in the rejection region. And so in this case, we have enough evidence against our null hypothesis. We reject the null and conclude that there really is a less than 50% chance that you have a positive blood type based on the data that we have. So uh, thanks for watching. This stuff takes some time to get used to. So I've provided some examples here. We'll do more examples in lecture 13b, and I'll provide some practice problems on Carmen as well at uh, um, 
you know, depending on when you're watching this, I guess I'll send out a Carmen message or something that when they're available. So any questions, please reach out, let me know. I hope your first week of um, online college went okay. So I think we'll be fine over the next few weeks. I have a feeling we're all gonna kind of get into a nice rhythm after this and, and this will be all right. We'll still learn something. So reach out if you have any questions. If you need anything, let me know and have a good weekend. Or I'm sorry, this lecture's for next week. Sorry, now I'm just kind of rubbing it in because I'm making this on Friday. Um, enjoy the rest of your week 13, I guess is what I meant to say, sorry.